Thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church Virtual Sunday School Class. We are in Lesson 69 of Isaiah. We'll be in Chapter 30, beginning in Verse 20. Before we get into our study, let us have a word of prayer. Father, we just pray that as we go through your word, that you'll lead us, that you'll guide us, that you'll bring us to proper conclusions, that you'll do all this by the Holy Spirit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Isaiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 20. This is lesson 69 of Isaiah. And Isaiah is still talking to the people around year 703 BC about the coming of judgment of God upon them. And we know that that comes into reality in 701 BC. So let's take a look at verse 20. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. After the period of judgment, the, the judgment for their disobedience, God will open Israel's eyes. They will see that their seers that their fortune tellers, that their false prophets were lying to them, were lying to them. And then they will see with their own eyes how they had been misled by these people. But God also, when he gives them the adversity and the affliction, call it the bread of adversity, the water of affliction. They're going to be living every day in adversity and affliction for a while. Because of that, they will be able to be receptive to what God wants them to learn. And then they will see with their own eyes how they had been misled. Verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. They will be guided on the path of what is right by God himself. Their instructions will not come from other people, will not come from leadership, will not come from false prophets, but from God, from God himself. So they will realize that by following God's instructions, by being obedient to God, that is the only proper way to live. And it's a hard lesson for them to learn. They have to go through a lot to learn it. And isn't that the way it is with our life? Once we train wreck it, we can look back and go, okay, God, I should have done it your way. I'll do it now. Don't let... Don't let a train wreck try to get you in the right place. Stop it and come to God. Verse 22. Then you will desecrate your idols, overlaid with silver, and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. Once you stop and say, okay, God, I'm going to do it your way now. You'll get rid of all the things in your life that don't belong there. All these idols. They, they were doing all kinds of uh, sacrifices to the idols for good luck. For good luck. The Babylonian captivity started in 586 B.C. and rid Israel of her idolatry. Idolatry forever. The Egyptians and the other earthly kingdoms around them had images of gold, silver, wood, whatever they could uh, make an image into, and they worshipped them. And we see the Israelites were falling into that too. They went to all the feasts. They went to all the festivals. They offered sacrifices to these idols as part of the feasts and festivals. Now, now that they can clearly see to live God's way is the only way, they're, they're finally going to get rid of those things. 
the things that don't belong in their life, they're finally going to get rid of them. And in the Old Testament, the, the menstrual cloth was to be burned. And these idols and everything that doesn't belong in, in the life that's on the path of God should be burned, should be destroyed, should be done away with. And now in verse 23 and 25, we, we move a little further out into the future. Uh, up until then, he was talking about what's going to happen in 701 B.C. Now we're going to go way out into the future, a future day, where agriculture, cattle, uh, food production, water resources will all prosper, will be in great abundance. And... Not only does God redeem his people then, he also redeems the land, everything around them. So let's take a look at verse 23. He will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground, and the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In that day your cattle will graze on med uh, broad meadows. The blessings of God will be upon their crops when they announce the false gods of the world. The fields will produce bountifully, and even their cows will grow fat in the pasture. Uh, verse 24. The oxen, the donkeys that work the soil, will eat fodder and mash, spread out with fork and shovel. They're not going to eat a skimpy meal. They're going to eat grain. Grain that was thought of as being of the highest grade. Grain that would be set before a king to eat. That's what these animals will eat. And then in verse 25, In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow in every high mountain and lofty hill. Powerful nations that oppress Israel Powerful nations that oppress Israel will come to an end. It's going to be a great slaughter. This, this is Armageddon. All the nations of the world in Armageddon come against Israel. And it's going to be a great slaughter. Israel will survive and they won't. And mountain streams will provide pure water. Those streams can be channeled to channel to irrigate the crops. Water will become plentiful in such a dry land because God provides it. Because God provides it. So we see a future of Israel that's going to be bountiful, beautiful, and free of oppression because the oppressors will be slaughtered. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds of the afflicted. The benefits from the natural bodies of light will be much greater. Increase in intensity of their light will work to people's advantage and not to their detriment. This is just saying there's going to be plenty of sunshine along with water to make the crops grow. They're going to be in the light of God. They're going to be in the good hands of God. And then in verse 27, See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. We see a picture of Jesus like that in the book of Revelation. And God has long hid himself. And he seemed to, to stay remotely in, in, in the worldly affairs. He would put his hands in it, but he wouldn't come down and be part of it. Jesus is going to come down. There's going to be a millennium period. Jesus is going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. That's what Isaiah is seeing here. We see it in the book of Revelation. And then verse 28. His breath is like a rushing torrent, rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sieve, a sieve of destruction. He places in the jaws of peoples a bit that leads them astray. He is going to totally, totally 
be in the lives of those oppressors and they're going to be crushed. They're going to be crushed. He's a uh, when Jesus comes to the earth, he separates the people from the sheep and the goats. He separates the nations from Israel as well. And the words from his mouth will burn out lust and evil from this world. And uh, that, he's got a two-edged sword as a tongue. And it cuts. It's the gospel. It's the scripture. It's the scripture. We must never forget that Jesus is judge as well as Savior. He will judge those nations that are constantly in error, constantly uh, trying to do away with Israel. And he jumps to a time when the wrath of God will come. Isaiah is going from 701 B.C. way out to the book of Revelation. And the vanity of the nations is their sin. And it's going to be cut down by the tongue of Jesus. And when that happens, look at verse 29. When that happens, and you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your hearts will rejoice. It's when people playing pipes go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. When God brings this judgment on the oppressors, when Jesus comes into this world, they will rejoice. God's wrath came out on the evil nations. There's going to be a song of rejoicing in Israel for those who are his followers. They're going to come to the place of worship in Jerusalem. They're going to come to the Holy Mount. They're going to come to the Holy Mount. And they're going to be playing musical instruments, and they're going to be singing. And there's nothing in this world that's going to stop them from doing it. Right now, they have to stop at the Western Wall. There's not going to be any stopping Israel in that day. They were on their way to the Holy Mount. And then verses 30 through 31, Assyria in particular, he comes back 701, 703, 701 B.C. And uh, God's enemies will fall to the divine storm and flood. Verse 30. The Lord will cause people to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire with cloudbursts, thunderstorms, and hail. A terrible destruction is going to be accompanied by the elements, including fire. We see this displayed in the book of Revelation. Hail, all kinds of things coming down from the sky, and he's going to destroy things with fire. People are going to be standing there in the flesh. It's going to burn right off of their bones. But he did this to Assyria in a certain way. Uh, in, in one night, God sent the angels and destroyed the Assyrian camp. The, the Israelites went to bed that night. They were fearful. That morning they got up and the enemy was gone. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his rod, he will strike them. God, God here in 703 B.C. is speaking a judgment against Assyria. And that judgment comes, I mean, in just a few hours. Just a few hours. They're done. They're done. They're destroyed. In just a few hours. Okay. Let's go on to uh, verse 32. Every stroke of the Lord lays on them with his punishing club will be to the music of timbrels and harps as he fights them in the battle with the blows of his arm. And God is actually going to be fighting for them now instead of punishing them. With each blow of punishment against the Assyrians, there will come joyful celebration in Jerusalem. Assyria will be beaten down by God. Its enemies shall rejoice. And 
This is exactly what happened in 701 BC, but this is a broader stroke. This is exactly what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. And then in verse 33, Topheth, Topheth has long been prepared. It's been made ready for the king. Its fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance of fire and wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of burning sulfur, sets it ablaze. Topheth is literally a place of abomination. Idolatrous Israel burned to the death human victims. The cult of Topheth was popular during the reign of Ahaz and Manasseh, <coughs> who have said to have sacrificed their own sons by setting them on fire as a sacrifice to Topheth. In the valley just north of Jerusalem, an area called the Valley of Hinnon, and later in the New Testament it was known as Gehenna, the place where the trash of the city of Jerusalem was taken outside the city gates and burned. It was a constant burning fire. It symbolizes hell when Jesus talks about it. The defeat will be so complete. Fire will burn continually. We know in the book of Revelation the beast Satan, the angels, they're going to be put into a lake of fire. And all of those who reject Jesus will also find themselves there. So Topheth is a place of burning. It's the lake of fire. This is the place for evil of the world to, to go. That's going to be its final destination. And the breath of Jesus starts that fire. False prophet, antichrist, the beast, Satan, Demons, they all go there. You don't want to go there. And that, uh, that finishes uh, chapter 30. So uh, I want to close with a word of prayer, and I encourage you to come next time for chapter 31. Let us pray. Father, we just pray that as we continue to study, as we continue to read, as we continue to go through your word, we just pray that you lead us and guide us by the Holy Spirit and that by the Spirit you bring us to proper conclusions. And Father, we just pray that you keep us healthy and safe until we meet again. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and may we all go in peace.